What a great three summer we have going on today. These are three artists who um, actually all started um, in the club show. Uh, so if you're familiar with the core show and how things work, I often um, start artists out if um, I want to get a reaction um, from our audience. Um, I start them out in the club show, which is a way that I have a little more room to spread out and um, bring artists in. And so all three of you started there and all three of you um, have moved into the core show since. Um, and I have to say, all three of you hit the ground running. Um, you've been wildly popular with our audience. And I think this is my um, curatorial perspective and standing back and, and knowing the show and how things go. I think that is due in large part because you have such fresh perspectives on the West, um, on landscape of the West, on our um, animals of the West and on stories of the West. So without further ado, um, I'm just gonna jump into David Camersall. Hi, David. Oh, hello everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Um, so David is um, David is a former illustrator. And I have said this many times, illustrators, former illustrators are some of my favorite, favorite artists to work with. Um, first of all, they know design and drawing and materials just they have it down cold. And they do because of the pressure of being an illustrator. It's uh, you get a call on one day, it's due the next day by noon or something ridiculous like that. And um, back in the days before the internet, you had a deadline and part of that deadline was racing across town to a FedEx Dropbox and getting original artwork in, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just pure insanity. So, so I mean, there's just nothing like that. Getting that ten thousand hours in, as as um, Malcolm Gladwell has discussed in his books, um, of just really pressing yourself to be better, 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 better all the time. Um, so, David has, you know, you tell me, David. It's been what in the last five years that you've been made the transition out of illustration into fine art, right? Is that about right? Well, yeah. There's a little stop in between. I was um, doing illustration work for a while, but I, I wasn't making enough money, and I kept disliking the up and down income. And um, I started looking around for other venues that I might be able to kind of dovetail into. And I landed into television and I was doing TV graphics for a long time. Wow. Um, so that was mm, 20 years worth of stuff there, but it's the same commercial art world where there's deadlines and clients to please. And, you know, you have to kind of think on your feet the whole time and, juggling several projects as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was at uh, STARS, the cable channel for almost 20 years and uh, started out as a designer and became senior designer, art director, creative director. And I ended up being promoted to the uh, head of the whole department. So I oversaw uh, 12 different designers and, and their work. Mm -hmm. And, um, but at, at that, point that was less being creative and more people managing, which managing uh, uh, designers is a lot like cat wrangling, you know, it's hard to yeah. get them all going in the same direction. Oh, um, so it's kind of like being an art curator then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Probably so, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't so as much fun and I was painting on the side during all this time, but just kind of for my own sake and own uh, uh, satisfaction. 
And then uh, one day I got called into the office and they said, we're eliminating your job. And my one, yeah, because it kind of came out of nowhere. But um, I, I sat and thought about it for like a week, whether to get back into it, because, you know, it was great money and great benefits and it was a fun, exciting job. But I thought, you know, I want to do this painting thing before I get too much older and just kind of see what happens. And um, so that was about um, seven years ago. And then... Um, things really started taking off for me about uh, maybe three or four years ago as a painter. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, sometimes those things, um, are, you know, uh, getting, having your job eliminated um, when you look back, wow, that, I mean, probably the best thing that could have happened to you. Well, I, I, I'd always thought about it, you know, I thought, well, how can I paint more and do my job less? But, you know, like I said, the, the money was a real hook and the, the benefits and everything else was just too great. But then I kind of took it as the universe decided to give me a little push off the plank, you know, and uh, so, uh, Or a yeah. massive push off the plank. Yeah. Hey, so David, let's, let's jump into your work. Sure. Um, so you have a really distinct style. And um, I think, you know, you could could really credit some of your bravery and jumping off into such a distinct style from the illustrative background that you come from. Like, I mean, you you have to just dive right into stuff. But, but I also want you to tell us about where the style came from, from within inside of you. Like, how did you draw this out? Well, I, what I know is mostly been self-taught and um, what I was teaching myself was to look to my heroes and to how they painted. So I looked to illustrators from the 1900s, J.C. Leindecker, Maxwell Parrish, N.C. Wyeth and all of these guys and you know that's that commercial art background but I just really admire their styles and developing a style was kind of in a crucial part of being a successful illustrator. You needed to somehow separate yourself from everybody else that's doing it. Um, so I would just really study them and the way I paint is the way I imagined that those guys would have painted <laughs> more or less. Yeah. So yeah, I just um, would start with a vintage image and uh, I would find things through uh, libraries and archives and mm. work with that. And then I would bring it into Photoshop, which was my background at STARS. We'd have to work up mock-ups and so on to show clients. And oh. that process worked well for me here where I would bring it into Photoshop and then I would start playing around with different backgrounds or environments and uh, all kinds of things just to see what would make for an interesting uh, composition. And uh, this piece behind me, the, the lady was a, a, a circus performer. I think she was in the Buffalo Bills Wild West show, which was like a big deal at the time. I mean, that was probably the greatest show on earth. And um, I just loved what she was wearing and the way her horse was decorated. And uh, so just kept that. But um, she was posed against like a tent or something kind of boring. So uh, in my travels, I'll take uh, photographs of mountains and skies and so on. And that's what I composited in the background. So I worked all of this out in uh, Photoshop. And then uh, once I got a composition that I liked, then I would transfer it over to the uh, canvas and start painting. Oh, fascinating. Hey, you know what? I'm going to screen share if you don't mind. I don't um, mind this image um, a little bit larger. And um, I really want you to talk about some of the stuff uh, about this and what you're doing um, to make these images. One, using old photos, so probably black and white photos, right? Yeah, yeah. so I have to invent the colors. Mm -hmm. um, and I do it mostly from a graphic standpoint, trying to, <laughs> get contrast and, you know, make, make for a more dramatic impact. Um, and I'm just guessing at what they would be, but sometimes I don't care. I just trying to make a, a visual statement with them. So I'll start the painting um, 
I usually paint the canvas a um, kind of a yellow tone. So if you look at yeah. that one cloud, kind of at the bottom between the, um, yeah, right there, that yellow is kind of my base color yellow. And I left that through there. But you can see it kind of like all over within the painting. And so I paint in kind of transparent and semi-transparent tones. So a lot of those colors from the original painting, original underpainting start to show through. You can even see it in the mountains below, um, right where your arrow is, that kind of gold color has just been kind of glazed over a little bit with um, some purple to, to get those shades. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of layering of color on top of color. And um, it, Love for that. me, it helps organize and puts the, uh, the colors in a community space so that they work well and play well with others. Mm -hmm. Nice. Hey, David, let's talk about some of these other images. And I am I really want to take a look at Hoppy. Okay. Um, and this is something that I know our audience absolutely loves. And for sure, it's just such a David Camerzal thing <laughs> where where these characters, it's almost like they're they get sucked into the the wallpaper. Yeah. You know? them yeah yeah so it's it's fun to do these and uh, again it just kind of started with playing around with different textures and patterns in photoshop and um you know trying this and that and the other mm -hmm. thing and then i thought well i wonder if i could like run it through his shirt or something and what that one looked like and i was just really happy with the results and how parts of them will recede into the pattern and other parts emerge forward i i just think that's great fun yeah, truly. And then I love how you have this outline here. You know, th this is always like, I keep saying this every talk that I we have with artists is that, so like right now, um, we would have hung all the work um, on the third floor for the yeah. show. And I am so missing this because I get to hold these pieces of art and I get to just study them and see all these great things about them. And as I've said before, uncreating a show is my Christmas. I just, <laughs> I love it. And so, um, but just to be able to see some of these subtleties you have going on, like the drawing of, of Hoppy here, it just is so wonderful. It's like all you need and this fabulous purple outline that kind of undulates behind him. It's just cool. Yeah, you know, I, I've been adding these uh, rectangles to a lot of the pieces and I just think it really helps um, frame the pieces and that blast of color really um, gives a little excitement and life to it as well. I'm going to move over to um, Lone Star. Where did this photo come from with those buffalo shops? <laughs> you know, he was another one of these uh, vintage archive uh, places mm -hmm. where I found some photos. And uh, I just love the way he looked and the way he was dressed and uh, his age as well. Um, you know, usually I got like the Marlboro Man or the, like the uh, the pinup girl uh, going on in the pieces. So I, I kind of liked uh, this guy's um, attitude and age a little bit as well. Um, and again, I'm inventing all of the colors. I, I don't really know uh, what colors he was dressed in. I, I do think his chaps were dark. Uh, but if you scroll down a little bit, um, and that little white thing there, I don't know how you can zoom in on that yet. Um, that was a spur and I made it into a star. And so that's where the title comes from, Lone Star. And uh -huh. of course, me being from Texas, Lone Star is, uh, you know, pretty pre prevalent. I love it. And you know what? Okay, I want to call attention to this fun detail here too. When you see this painting, look at how these colors get intense here and then intense here, but then fade away. It's... Yeah. It, just like this great transition into the back, the the um, the what he's standing on, and then it draws you back up into him. It just it just like pulls the whole painting together, and yeah. this really fun Art Deco design background. Yeah, much fun. Yeah, I like that fan pattern a lot, and I, I kind of want to use it again. It, it's it was it took a while to do, but I I was 
it was a, a fun pattern to work with. So, uh, so as a curator, I love finding artists like David, like Stephanie, like Elsa, um, because uh, so a lot of artists have found these um, old vintage photos and they've, they've done stuff with them. Um, but what I <clears throat> am most interested in is the very creative way that you use them because just redoing an old vintage photo is not that interesting and a lot of artists do it. But what you're doing with it, like the Art Deco background or for example, um, this next piece that I've pulled up here, Mabel 2.0, um, you know, what, what you're deciding to leave in the photo and what you're deciding to take out and where you're drawing my eye into it. Um, so would you talk about Mabel 2.0? Yeah, I really was happy the way this piece turned out. Um, this is um, Mabel Strickland, who was a famous rodeo performer from the early 1900s. And it's 2.0 because I, I changed her face. Uh, to somebody else. Oh. Uh, yeah, so that's not really her face. And I've been doing this a lot with pieces where, um, and it was nothing against Mabel. Uh, it was just that, um, well, you know, it's been a crazy year. And um, a friend of mine uh, posted this photo of her grandmother on social media that she had just passed away. And she was a um, Holocaust survivor. And uh, the photo of her grandmother was taken probably from the late um, 40s to early 50s, I'm guessing. And so um, I, I was just kind of struck with the photo and I liked her um, kind of world weariness, um, you know, like she's taken several humps, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, she's like, you know, I'm still here, I'm still standing. And um, just in light of all the stuff that's been going on, it just kind of, sang out to me. Wow. Yeah, so I just, um, I really liked the, the, I was really happy with how the piece came out. I love that. That is wonderful. What a great story. Okay, so let me go, let me um, move over to In Your Dreams We Fly. <laughs> oh, I love this. Yeah, so if, so a little bit of the same story where we got, um, I kind of see this as um, kind of symbolic of jumping over obstacles and hurdles that are put in your path, but also um, kind of a leap over uh, technology as well. And this is Alice Sisti, who was, uh, she would do this performance um, in, in rodeo shows. She would actually jump over cars. But I took her photo and reinvented the rest of the scene here, a uh, different car and different environment and so on. Um, but I was just struck with the um, cojones of this woman that she would stand on two horses galloping and jumping over this car. And you can see by the way that the horses are positioned that this isn't going to be a smooth landing. This is going to take some skill and some balance on her part to not completely biff it when she lands. But, um, you know, I just like the, um, the joy that she is expressing in, in doing this, um, this uh, trick. Oh, my God. She just looks just so crazy happy instead right. of totally terrified. Right, right. <laughs> and I love how her hat's flying off her hair. Yep. Okay, and then, of course, these two old guys standing in the background. Yeah, they're because, like, huh, well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who'd have thunk it? We told yeah. you crazy. So how did you decide on that car? Um, I, I kind of, well, I just like the, um, the styling of the car. I was trying to find something that was close to that same uh, time, uh, time period. I love um, But I just like the deco streamlined styling of it. Oh, I love it. Um, oh, David, this is so great. Okay, so... Um, Back to you, and I am going to zip over to Stephanie. But David, don't go anywhere. I um, won't. 
Here. Um, hey, just a couple comments uh, from Blake Welch. Love your work. Big fan of the illustrators from N.C. Wyeth, James Bama, etc. Um, Cedar says most of the models in David's paintings are uh, have morbid expressions. Is this on purpose? Especially the scary face on Hoppy. Um, Hoppy yeah. was um, that's Hoppy was a. Um, well, it's William Boyd as an actor who played Hopalong Cassidy in uh, in the films, and so the the image that I used there was like from a studio card from a from one of his films. Gotcha. So I, I just liked his pose and his fierceness and his, uh, you know, I'm not going to take any gruff from these guys. So. That was a, it. Kind of reminded me of those old movies, you know. That, yeah. That's yeah. Exactly what. Yeah, a lot of Hollywood reference in in my pieces. Yeah, exactly. Okay, go nowhere, David. We're coming I'm back. Right here. <laughs> Stephanie. Hi, you have to say hi, Stephanie. Yep. Can't you hear me? Nope. Now I can. Hi. Hi. Welcome to my studio. Hi. Yay! Good to see you, Stephanie. Um, okay, so you are on the spotlight. Um, don't get nervous. Um, <laughs> okay, so Stephanie, um, you have such a wonderful um, um, kind of uh, crazy path you took into the art world um, via science and architecture. And then finally, you um, threw up your hands and said, you know what, I've, I, this is where I should be. I'm gonna quit avoiding it. <laughs> this is my interpretation. <laughs> I'm gonna quit avoiding being an artist and I'm gonna go for it. And look what's happened. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. It's still a an experience for me. It's still something that I wake up some days and say, really? Wow. Um, that's how far away I was from, from even envisioning this as a life. So yeah, I started out on a path to, um, engineer. I went to an engineering school to go into chemical engineering, had great visions of being in a laboratory and wearing a white coat and yeah. you know, creating things there. And then, um, that it became really clear. I mean, unfortunately, it was a bit heartbreaking um, that this, this really wasn't my place. And there was a whole creative side of me that I, I just sort of kept turning a blind eye to, if that makes any sense. I was, I was musically inclined. I played a lot of different instruments and did some other things, but I just didn't give them a whole lot of credit as being um, really, as being, oh, I'm really a very fully creative person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I transferred, I went to architecture, I, get into, I went into architecture, uh, very satisfying for quite a while. And it is the blend of, I do seriously have a nerdy brain that loves to, I have great curios, curiosity in that way, mechanically sort of fascinated with things. It's just that I have this real creative side. So architecture was a beautiful blend of that for the longest time and it's full life-size sculpture, it's art. And it, wow. it certainly has informed me. I don't always give it credit, sorry architecture, but um, it's not why I paint structures. However, it helps me paint these structures. And um, yeah, I mean, I reached a point where I, I was home, I'd started a family and my girls being young, I think, you know, allowing myself being in this place of I really wanted them to create and I wanted them to have all this good yummy stuff. It lit, up, it lit it up in me. <laughs> so one day, let me take a painting class. And, and now, again, you know, we all say, but, here, you know, the rest is history. Here I am. And it was a path. It took some time. Uh, and I'm thrilled with how it's, it's happened. And, um, mm. and I continue to feel, you know, reinventing myself at the easel most, most of the time. <laughs> so, okay, I have a question for you. And then we're going to dive into your work. Um, you are also teaching um, now, after it's been a number of years, quite a few years um, of painting and, um, and really just learning a lot. And now you're giving back, you're teaching, you're mentoring. Um, 
I'm curious how many people come to you from the same kind of position you came from that I was this um, and I really want to come back to myself. I, I want to explore this. Do you get that? I get it. I get it a lot. And, you know, honestly, for me, when I was coming into it, I was, I, I was that as well. You know, I, I would read the, the stories I would read in magazines of artists about people who had this other life prior and then had made that step, had taken that leap really moved me because I was in my head a bit about, I didn't go to art school. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, there's a bit of um, process that I thought I had to go through in order to be where I am and seeing people carve it out a little bit differently. Those were the stories that really lit me up. And so I've gone on my path and I've done what I've done. And um, sometimes I don't think too much of it. I guess that's kind of what we do, you know, in life. We're just yeah. plugged along and somebody says, wow, uh, how did you do that? And you kind of stop and say, oh, I, I didn't think it was necessarily that unique or interesting. However, you're right. I mean, there are a number of people so that have this creativity in them and they're just oh, it's always maybe someday, maybe someday I'll do it. And I think it, I think it matters. I think it really means something to us to meet people who have done it before us, right? So we can just follow, oh my gosh, she did it. I think I could do that. I can relate to her in some way. And I really aspire when I'm working with students, I'm really aspiring to, or artists, I don't even like calling them students. I, I, <laughs> I like working with other artists who, it's just who they are inside and they're ready to go. And so um, letting them, giving them permission and showing them like, you can do this, it's okay. I, I'm losing myself a little bit here, but it's, it does feel like paying it back. And my conversation with people is more about being in touch with what's going on here than, than necessarily the technical. We cover this. But sure. um, a lot of creatives keep their creativity in a box. And when they get the space and the safety and the permission to bring it out, their life changes. Yeah. So that is what we do as artists. When we put our work out there in the world and people see it, that's that kind of first step. But when they meet us and kind of, oh, my gosh, I've always wanted to. I love opening that door for people. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that, Stephanie. So I want to dive in and talk about your paintings. And I want to just read Chad. Okay, Chad, sorry, I'm just going to slaughter your last name. Scrubina uh, says, Stephanie, love your work and am so happy a piece from you is in my collection. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I'm like, sorry if I, I anyway, yay. <laughs> um, okay, so Stephanie, let's talk about this tractor. Okay, and I want you to, I want you to tell us a little bit about your, so are you, you're, you're born and raised in Colorado, right? I am. I'm a proud fifth generation Colorado. I think it really is, it's deep in me. I think it really is why I paint some of this stuff. Uh, that's a really butchered way of describing what I do, but I think there's this deep line and love of Colorado, our open space. I paint outside of Colorado, I paint images that are beyond those boundaries, but um, there's my, you know, going back to that first generation that came here, they were cattle farmers and they had property out in Eastern Colorado. And it's just, I never experienced it. I didn't even really know for a really long time, but I've been pulled to it for, I've just been pulled to it. So I love getting in there. Yeah. 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 Well, so could you talk about, let's talk about your work, but I also am, am curious about why you pick what you pick to paint. Um, this um, big red, this tractor, um, and this one we were talking about before we, we went live with the webinar, there's, there's a lot of texture on this and people who have seen your work up close, um, I, I personally have one of your, you call them the twizzle, twizzle sticks. Um, so they're those, um, the, the motel signs, lots of heavy, confident brushwork in those. And this one has a lot of that too. Um, I'm gonna do a screen share um, for this one too, but I'm wondering, tell me about Big Red, 
but also let's kind of talk a little bit about how you decided to depict this painting. Sure. Um, well, first, Big Red, um, what's really fun to me with signage, with this tractor, um, some of other farm equipment, or even buildings, train cars, you know, I'll see them and I fall in love with the shape. So I approach my work in what I feel like is a real sculptural mentality. I don't really feel like I'm painting when I'm painting. I feel like I'm sculpting. And the words that I use to describe how I put my paint down and, 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 and move through it, to, they're, they're all very sculpture. I talk about carving space, layering, um, pulling, all of these things, and even the, some of the tools that I use. So. Um, uh oh, I just like, where did I go? Oh, so when I'm looking at these, uh, when I see an object, I'm looking at things sculpturally. Earlier, I said something about, I don't paint um, barns and things like that because I ar was an architect. And maybe somebody could argue with me on that, but I paint these forms. I paint beautiful forms to me. So there's gotta be a lot of interest and in around the, what I would say is the envelope of them. So here with the, uh, the tractor, this is a beautiful sculptural form to me. There's some shadow things happening, but there's texture. There's all these places for me to move around. And I chose to depict it this way rather than put it in a setting with, you know, farm scene and everything, because this painting is all about the beauty of this object, somebody, <laughs> and go with me here, somebody created this, somebody designed this, and I'm honoring that. And I'm also honoring the number of people who've sat in that seat and pulled that around. And, and uh, there's just so much that happens in there and I wanna get into the character of it. So I've isolated it in that way that you engage with it more than if you just sort of saw it in a scene because you might get distracted by what's going on back there. And oh man, that's a barn, no, that's kind of nice. I really want you here. And, um, and, and as much as I can to feel, um, expose the character and the oxidation and just things like that, you really understand this has been a real weathered, um, steadfast partner <laughs> out there in the field. This piece, um, I was playing around with this a little bit differently in that I've got this little line through here. I wanted to bring some color. Sometimes I just completely strip everything white around here, but I wanted to, there is a conversation. This is connected to a farm property. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a taste of that and pull you in and across, but I don't want it to be about that. We're right in here. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to do a quick little screen share so we can dive in a tiny bit more into this um, painting. And so let me do this. And yeah, so I don't know if you can see that texture, but that's what we're, you know, what Stephanie brings to these that is so fascinating to me. And, and also what I love is, okay, see this like swirly brush stroke here. So, so in a way you've got this paint laid in underneath it, and then you're coming back with these big, thick, confident brush strokes, and you are directing my eye now to exactly what you want to talk about in this painting, but leaving some fun little surprises like here's our barn and the farm right behind it. You didn't paint that out. And you, you bring up exactly the word that I love. I love having, <clears throat> I, my, I aspired for all of my paintings to be something that from far away you see and you engage initially with the design of what's going on. And, but there's something a little interesting about the texture, something going on. So as you get closer and closer, more and more is revealed to you. And as you get up really close, you start to see little surprises, little things that are left buried, you know, revealed, peeking through. And when I paint, you know, people often ask me about this vertical and horizontal, you know, patterning thing. I don't even know if they would use it that way, but this is um, that, is really important to what I'm doing. My conversation is at one hand, okay, here's this object that we all are familiar with, but I wanna give you a really beautiful abstract pattern to sink into as well. So mm -hmm. I have this layering um, concept of, I have abstraction and pattern, and then I have, um, you know, um, 
realism. And so when I'm pulling these paints, some of this looks like I just kind of winged it on there. I just put it on there really quick. Those are very thoughtful brush strokes. I think a lot, of, I watch how the paint breaks. If I don't really love that, I literally scrape it off and I put it back down. And I look for a variety of width and shape and length as much as I can to continue to create interest. So even if you had this on your wall for five years, you might walk by and say, oh my gosh, look at that cool little spot. And yeah. was, so there's a real interesting, totally nerdy part of how I think about my work, very layered. I love it. Um, so let's talk about these. Let's talk about weathering and Western ballot. And then I'm going to click out of screen share so we can see them in your studio. Um, but so weathering. And again, you know, if you're watching, if you're looking here, you can see these wonderful dragged brush strokes right here that I love. Um, and some more of these just really thoughtful ways of creating this mood in this painting. I'm wondering if you would talk about inspiration and mood for weathering. Yes, um, so this one's a little more subtle. You know, the, 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 what I'm doing here, a little softer, certainly in the sky, because I, I don't want you to get away that way. I want you to be on the sides of the barn and feeling, Oh, I just often imagine, you know, that there's the sound of that grass as it blows a little bit in the wind. There's this feeling of the heat at times, you know, you're just out there, it's on the back of your neck and there's a smell to all of that. And you know, I can't, <laughs> I can't really give you all of that. And yet I hope to give you that. And I hope to give you a beautiful path too of little moments of light that can carry you through that painting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> So texturally, I have uh, new, I actually discovered some new ways of, of articulating, uh, you know, the, the foreground. The foreground has been really something for me to paint this past couple of years. And I'm like, I'm bound and determined to figure out how I, how I would say it. I know how a lot of other people do, but I think we really all have our own unique language. And I'm, I'm finding it here in, in all of these grasses and leaves and everything. This is a quiet space. There's been a lot of work here, but uh, you know, I, I have, mm, how do I wanna describe it? It's, it's like, I feel like I paint more of the echoes and it's a portrait of this, this life that's been you know, our backbone for so long. These barns and, and the space and where they land and the equipment that's laying around or overgrown shrubs, all of this is an indication of the time that has passed and this history. Um, so this mood here to me is, is quiet, but absolutely <laughs> interesting. <laughs> is that a mood, interesting mood? Um, you know, walking along, I think that might be what I like in this is you feel like you're coming up and you're gonna walk along and you're noticing where this shrub came up in the corner and then, oh, there's some rocks over here and just really engaging with a tactile um, texture, even though, you know, we can't, you know what I mean? These are all memories yeah. that we have when we walk up. You know, it's reminding me of talking to, uh, to Howard Post. Um, for those of you who know Howard, um, he um, paints, like he, he was a rodeo cowboy and he um, has certainly been in his share of, you know, crazy situations, but um, Howard always paints the quiet. And so oh, wait, that's really yeah, that's sort of what you're what you're giving us too is is the quiet. Sorry, you go back really quick. I just want to really quickly point out some of the in, some of the things that are happening in that one, um, and these are the things that I'm talking about where I kind of hide stuff, and it's but it's in there. So yeah. If you zoom in a bit on the side of the left side of the barn, so there's this big red shape, which is sort of a paneling thing that was happening, but you can see over to the um, side of the there's a <laughs> Like, how do I describe this? There's a little window cut out and you see some yellow stripes happening. Yeah, right here? Yeah, those are softly underneath. Um, they're softly underneath all of these layers. So there's a, I, I have this other thing going on there where I've thrown the red all around and I've got some yellow spots around that have nothing to do with grass or barns or anything like that. Again, it's just a way that I try to move you through. Sorry, that was a quick little afterthought. 
Nice. Um, okay, so I am, just so we can get Elsa in here, let's just quickly talk about Western Ballot. I have ever wanted to uh, capture the huge open space that I feel. Well, I go out and I drive quite a bit and, and um, take in these beautiful ranches and, and properties and or just out on the road. And I have really been wanting to, this year, really wanting to begin capturing this this volume, this sense of space. And when I came across this moment as I was driving, it just I just had to stop. This huge, beautiful bank of clouds coming up but, and this quiet, small presence down there. But so, oh, it was just so poetic to me. I just dove right in, Rose. No, it's a, so to me, it's also, it almost feels like this right here is just so quiet. It's a whisper and it's almost just going away, yeah. you know? And I love this. I love this pink, the pink in the clouds. It's so subtle. <laughs> this was. This has been so exciting for me to explore organic shape. You know, I spend a lot of time with my straight. I have a stick. I use a lot, and I um, I love it. And I have some other tools to do all this. But for me to now come into this organic expression has been really exciting, and blending colors in, and figuring out texture. And the the Western Ballad here is so fantastic down in here, and it was something that just that I've just now discovered. I mean, I can't <clears throat> excuse me, I can't wait to see where this goes. You know, so yeah, right. Will you do me a favor and just move your, your screen so we can see those paintings with you in them so we can get an idea of size? There you go. And then um, I have a question from Susan Williamson. She is asking, do you use other tools in addition to brushes in your work? I do, Susan. I have, um, I have to, um, you know, oh my goodness. I have things like this. <laughs> yeah. Quite a bit, and they are very different in how I'll use those. But they, um, in many ways, have become, you know, my right hand. They are. I use them as much, sometimes even some paintings, even more than my brushes. So there's a, a combination of things that I use uh, a fair amount to get that happening. Wonderful. Okay, so Elsa. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Go nowhere. Go nowhere, my friend. We're coming back to you. Hello. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so um, you are one of those artists. You started in the club like everybody else on this call. You are one that from the start, people have been pretty close to literally fighting over your work. <laughs> um, um, That's nice to hear. It is nice to hear. Um, on the on the curatorial, the art show side, the sales side of it, um, it gets it can get a little touchy at times because, you know, the whole I saw it first, it's mine kind of thing. Um, but it's great when that happens. Um, and again, you know, with you. Um, you are doing something so different and unusual. And I remember the first time I saw your paintings, um, I think it was at a Ben gallery. And I believe you were still just trying to move your way into painting. And I think you were still working as a stylist, a hair stylist. And um, I know at that point I had quit a couple years before. Yeah. I was okay. a hairstylist for 27 years yeah. and um, decided I had another path to take. It just wasn't satisfying my creativity anymore. And um, my back was bugging me and I thought, you know what, I'm not doing this till I'm, till, till I'm some old hairdresser, washed out hairdresser. So um, I started just taking some classes at the Art Students League, yeah. randomly, and just without even thinking too hard, just started painting. And mm. shortly after that event, yes, a gallery picked me up and then my work sort of took off before I even knew really what I was doing in you know, my eyes. 
So you said something that I really want to um, draw out just a tiny bit more. And I think this is so important. And I think this is really a key to why we see such inventive, creative things coming out of you um, that you you didn't um, stop and, and just give it a ton of thought like, oh, my gosh, this is the way things are done. Um, these are the way this is this is the stuff I learned in art school and I have to do it this way. Like you came really unencumbered to the painting process. And I know you had a lot of growing pains over the years. I mean, you've you've been doing this for over a decade now, right? About 10 years, yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that just that wonderful, like allowing yourself just to try stuff. Um, how about putting a cow on a couch and a painting behind it and then a bird that's kind of um, dropped in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, Florence um, is, is right over your shoulder here. Will you talk to us about this painting? Yeah, um, so this, my paintings um, entertain me. <laughs> so what I do is I use imagery, first of all, that um, I feel emotionally attached to somehow. This cow um, and all the cows and the animals that I choose in my paintings have to have some sort of expression that um, that I fall in love with. Some either a quirky expression or something deep and something that like I can connect with their eyes. Mm -hmm. And so this is a cow I chose. This bird is um, around. Actually, this bird is. Um, someone I know in Italy, she takes pictures of her birds on her property. And so this was one of the photos that she um, took of that bird. And then this woman is just some old painting that I, I don't know, I have this thing about putting these like, paintings in the back of my art. But a lot of this has to do with, I'm figuring it out finally. I, I have this deep, appreciation and love for interiors and um, interior design and color combinations and just like bold imagery and uh, also I love animals and so it's all kind of coming around. Um, I would for years even before painting pour through um, interior design magazines and um, rearrange the house and it was a big joke I paint our house many different colors while the kids were sleeping oh taking my God. naps um, and so this all I don't know this is like a collection of everything that's been in my mind and I love so gardening I've always been loving garden design and um so it's interesting how this all comes together. And in this piece, I see this sort of circular thing. This bird is looking at her and she is looking at the cow and the cow's looking out. Yes. So and there's an interesting like connection here. You know, okay, so I'm gonna do a quick screen share with this one because I have to tell you something that just, lights this, <clears throat> excuse me, lights this painting up for me is this turquoise on the ears. It's just so magnificent. This, it's like this, the cow is, it, I don't know what it does to me, but it just makes this cow so sweet and so dear, but it puts the focus on it. And it's, it's such an amazing color that I don't think people would normally put with a cow. Well, of course, how many cows are on couches in paintings? <laughs> <laughs> right. What inspired yeah. this? Tell me about, tell me about how, when you're going along, like, and you're just like, oh, this needs turquoise around the ear. Yeah, you know, um, I, I get to a point, this, this actually, this painting I started in March 
So it's been months going on. And some of my paintings are like that, where I start them one way and then I let it sit, I come back to it. It didn't start with the, the ear like that. And then I get, I even sanded some parts back down that weren't working. I um, layered paint real thick. There's a lot of real thick texture um, on the side of this. Um, there's just a lot of texture in the background. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I get, I get to a point where I just get kind of, just I let it go because there's something about it that almost seems too restrained. And then that ear just like was like, I don't know. One day I just had to do that. I, I couldn't, I can't even tell you where that came from. Mm. I just lined it with the brighter color. Um, it, it just evolves like that and it just comes out of me somewhere. So it's like, I let it go and I don't, I know that paint can be changed. So if I don't like it, I do it over. I do another <laughs> color over it. I don't care. I love it. Okay, so <laughs> let's go through some of these other paintings um, uh, reflecting. Let's talk about this little gem. It's 20 by 19. So again, a cow standing in a boat with the oars in the water um, reflecting. Like, would you talk about some of the, like what, what you're thinking of when you're coming up with these paintings? <sighs> Yeah, you know, um, it's funny, I've been doing the animals in the boats and, and I'm still trying to figure out why that is. <laughs> like, there, there's something deep in my imagination that I haven't figured out about this boat thing. I, I enjoy painting the water and again, this animal just looks really thoughtful and um, you know, to me, it's just, you know, reflecting this, how it looks, it looks peaceful. Um, I don't have like a deep meaning in these other than being, taking imagery and working with it and pasting it together. And I don't know, it's just like this, I, I enjoy the way it looks and the way it makes me feel. You know what I was thinking? So I've got evening up on, on the screen. And what kind of struck me as you were saying that, like really, uh, you know, who knows why there are cows in boats. I almost feel like you're giving us a glimpse into your, um, your dream world. I am. That's true. Because I dream a lot. And actually sometimes it's a joke. I kind of run to bed and can't wait to get to my dreams. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Uh -huh. Okay, so, all right, so here's evening. Um, and um, this cow is definitely heading off to bed. Right, well, and you know, to me again, this was just like this peaceful, lovely interior. And then this cow, this just juxtaposition of a cow in a home. And I, I also feel like my you know, there's sort of this anthropomorphic thing about my animals where it's like they have human qualities, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, living in spaces that people live in. Yeah. Um, but it is very dreamlike. And um, also sort of a sense of humor. And I think art should take you to a different place not be so literal, um, kind of, you know, escape something. That's how I see it. And that's why I paint. <laughs> yeah. Because it's actually very therapeutic for me to come to a place in my head where I'm removed from everything else. Okay. And I totally love that this cow <laughs> has a portrait of his dog on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't know that it's the cow's house. It's just a house. Yeah, right. Okay, right. so let me see. Foxy, okay, mm -hmm. so you don't do, uh, like, this is a bit of a departure 
for mm-hmm. you. You have done some foxes in the past that are just always fun and whimsical. Um, and so here's Foxy with these great little patchwork colors and some some gardening and um, this really sly smile on his face or just this little look of, I don't know, satisfaction or something, um, contemplation. But so tell us about the foxes. Well, you know, I just, uh, I thought, you know, it's time for me to do a different animal. I did cow, I have been painting cows for so long, but I find foxes kind of naughty and um, intriguing and beautiful and um, exotic. And I just thought, you know, this is another animal I want to dive into. Yeah. And so Foxy is right here. It's... Um, I love all the textures in it. And again, this was a piece that I was working with for a while and kind of reworked. And then the the background just happened. This wasn't thought out ahead of time. A lot of this is very spontaneous and um, just happens as it does. But the colors, the textures are really satisfying to me. Yeah, it feels that way. It feels that way looking at your work that um, it, the paintings give that off to me. And I think that's something that draws people in and they don't really know why necessarily, um, because it may not be the kind of art that they've thought of collecting before, just because it's like, well, I don't collect cows or I don't collect this or like that's too far fetched for me. And yet there they are standing in front of it with a big smile on their face and just really enjoying it a lot. And that's such a wonderful thing that you give us. Um, Andrea Burns comments, your cows are so dignified. I love them. I agree. I totally agree, Andrea. (laughs) Um, so, all right, we are actually at one o'clock, but Stephanie, did you want to show us a, just a quick little bit of, of how you put these? I, I'm sorry, uh, Elsa, I'm watching Stephanie. <laughs> um, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, so here is, for example, this is just a boat. This was one of my paintings I've done before. And I, and I find these, um, I do sort of a cut and paste this imagery and um oh my you know God. they just simply go in these things <laughs> so it's like paper dolls i don't do photoshop well and so again it's just putting them together with paper oh my God. and for example there was someone that has a fox sanctuary on instagram i found this fantastic fox that she took this is on her sanctuary and um, I asked her, got her permission and I'm gonna use this box in a painting, but you could see it has this like curious, odd, great potential and not to say I'm gonna paint any of this in it, but I just love this odd character of him. Oh my gosh, he's totally naughty. It's, that's, he is naughty. That's perfect for your work. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Elsa, Stephanie, David, um, I love to end these calls. Um, and if you all are listening in and want to hang on for just a sec, um, a couple minutes, but I love to end these with two things. One, if you have any questions or comments for each other. And the other thing is, how did you get to where you are today? Maybe just sort of a quick, like, what was that spark? And we've touched on it for each one of you. Um, but sometimes, you know, people have asked, like, did you go to art school? Um, you know, I'm wondering, Stephanie and Elsa in particular, was there an artist, at, you know, maybe at the Art Students League or somebody who really, like, just made you say, I can do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to chase this. And David, for you as well. Um, so jump in. <laughs> We're all- I would say for me, there was no one particular teacher. And I'm glad for that because I didn't want to copy a teacher. All I wanted to know was what kind of surfaces do I use? What kind of brushes do I use? What do I, how do I even start? And, and I, I, I just, 
did it on my own my own way and so I love more abstract art I have to say the, the realism isn't something that I'm super drawn to but um so that's that's my short answer not one particular perfect David I don't know that I um if there's one person I, I mentioned J.C. Landecker and Maxfield Parrish and some of those illustrators really jumped out at me but <clears throat> there's so many artists whose work I admire and um, you know it's like oh I, I really want to do something like that you know it's just this <clears throat> push from all of those artists to get out there and and try and do stuff like that there's other artists too where I look at their work and I go well I think I want to go back to working in TV, you know, because they're just so good and it's a little bit like overwhelming. Wait, who are, those, who are those artists in TV that? Well, not in, t well, not in, well, there's some TV artists that are really great, but uh, I heard a guy say one time that uh, when he looks at a lot of art, it just inspires him to do more art. And then he looks at Rembrandt and he wants to quit. Yeah. And <laughs> there's some artists where I, I could say that too, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephanie. I, I so kind of like Elsa. I, I didn't come out like, oh my gosh, I want I, I, For me, in some ways, I. Hey, I love Stephanie, would you speak up a little bit more? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I want to say, in some ways, I. Um, I there isn't any one. Uh, there are artists that are sort of my heroes. And I love looking at their work. Actually, um, an artist that stands out the most is Wyeth in that his connection with place and sense of place is everything to me. And I think a lot of artists, that's what we're, we're creating a sense of place for you to go and for us to go. Um, so that's something that stands out. But, but I tread lightly looking around at a lot of different art. I really have this thing around, I don't want to see too much I really want to see what comes out of me as much as possible. And so I enjoy this huge range. It, it actually leans a little more towards an expressive um, abstraction. I get excited about mark making and like real confident, bold ways to lay paint down. And I'm like, oh. so it's again, a permission of, it doesn't have to be perfect, just um, beautiful. So uh, I love it. I love it. I want to thank you all so very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, these talks have just been a, a real highlight. And, you know, I feel like this is um, making lemonade out of lemons for us this COVID year. Um, so many people have emailed us and just commented on how great these talks are because they get into your studio, which they normally wouldn't be able to do. Um, and they get to just hear these great stories and um, see you talk about your work and learn so much about the work and about you in this great little setting. Um, so I want to let everybody know we are going to keep them going. Um, we have several more talks coming up. So please uh, go to CoorsWesternArt.com. You can sign up for those talks and they're all being recorded. So you will find them on the website as well. Just follow the links um, to get to those recordings. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people are going back and watching um, the ones that they miss. So that's been really wonderful. Um, um, I also want to let you know, um, please do go when you go to CoorsWesternArt.com, um, the uh, show will be an online sale, obviously, um, and that's going to be through Handbid. So from our website, you can be connected into Handbid where all the artwork lives um, and dual with our website. Um, the bidding uh, starts officially December 18th, but I think you can probably get in there right now and, and do that, but you need to register. Um, and it works a little bit like eBay. So when you like something um, or you put a bid in, you will get pinged when um, there's action on that. So that's kind of nice. Um, uh, then everything culminates on January 5th. We're going to have a small, a short 
short little fun presentation. Um, and we're going to announce winners of an, a number of awards that we have like best in show. So that's January 5th. So tune in for that as well, but go to CoorsWesternArt.com. You can see all the artwork there um, and then follow on through to hand bid to register. Um, uh, Cedar says, thank you, Rose, and to all the artists for the great presentations. It was inspiring. I agree. I'm so inspired by this. And I love David, Stephanie, Elsa. I love that you all have come from different places and you're here. And I feel like you've come home to yourselves in a way in your art. And it shows. It's joyous. And um, you give that to the world. So Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Everyone who's listening in, thank you again. Take care, guys. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, everyone. Bye.